Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to speak. It's a real honor to, to be here talking to you all. Um, I mean, I was just saying before the meeting started that I think Down Ancient Trails is a real pioneering and world leading example of how research can be shared across you know, the global network without sort of us being siloed into our geographic locations. And I, it's a real privilege uh, for me to be able to present here to you. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, what I'm going to talk to today is, is primarily around the Stone Age site of Ismila in Tanzania. And just to flag really that this is a, a collaborative uh, sort of body of work. Uh, myself at Brighton, uh, Dr. Pastori Bushozi from the University of Dar es Salaam, uh, John McNabb at the University of Southampton, Martin Bates at uh, Lampeter and Trinity St. David, uh, Phil Toms from Gloucestershire, and Jeff Duller at Aberystwyth. Uh, Professor David Nash, uh, who's also from Brighton, um, you'll see a picture of him later, and you may recognize his name. He had a publication come out this week about his uh, raw material sourcing at Stonehenge. So um, this was some stuff that Dave did before that big paper came out. And uh, Dr. Amanda Quekerson uh, from the um, uh, National Museum of Tanzania. So it's a, it's a real collaborative effort, and I certainly can't take any credit for this on my own. Um, in terms of the talk outline, I'm just sort of like to sort of give a bit of a background to the site of Ismila and a bit of an insight into why I, I particularly found this site uh, interesting uh, to study. And then I'll give a bit of a history about the publications, uh, how the site has been published uh, over, over time, and the summary then of our knowledge base about it, which will then lead into why we kind of felt the need to, to return to the site to try and do some um, more recent field work there. And then it sort of be a start to zoom out from Isamila and look at kind of um, this region of Eastern Africa in a bit more detail about the potential really for future archaeological work there and future collaboration. Um, and then if there's still time, I will maybe sort of just throw some food for thought um, about what some of the results may or may not mean. So uh, Isamila is named after Isamila Hill, which is the one that you can see in the center of the picture in front of us. And um, you can see this erosion, if, my, if I move my mouse, you can see this erosion gully sort of in the foreground. This is the, the, the southern branch, or so the eastern branch of uh, Isamila heading towards this Isamila Hill here. Um, but where is Isamila? So Isamila is in Tanzania in the Iringa Highlands, about 600 kilometers from Dar es Salaam, which is just opposite the coast of, um, just, just opposite Zanzibar here. And if we zoom into the Iringa region, uh, Iringa is named, region is named after the Iringa, Iringa town, which is located here, just at the top of a, a steep escarpment, and the Ruaha River is flowing uh, at the base of that. And you can, you can make out that sort of steep, um, sort of um, a drop here. Isamila is located um, further south, and you can see the white sands here of the erosion gully um, showing up clearly on these sort of satellite Im uh, I imagery. And this road that runs uh, southwards here is the main road uh, down to Zambia. So there's a lot of uh, truck freight on there. And that's actually, th that road plays a, a part of the story of its discovery. And if I zoom into Isamila again, uh, you can see that we've got this erosion gully of a, what's called the north and the southern branch. So the northern branch is where these white sands are, and that tends to be where the archaeology is mostly located. 
The Southern Branch um, has some amazing uh, geological features, which I think there's a couple of pictures of in, in the talk. And these geological features are actually on the national curriculum for children in Tanzania. So you get lots of um, school visits to the site um, to, to look at these geological features. Uh, the museum uh, at the site is located just up here. And we were camping at the campsite um, just at the top of the uh, up here. And this is Isamila Hill, uh, for which the site is named after. And you can see that this erosion gully continues sort of towards the uh, to, towards the west and, and the road that um, heads uh, south towards Zambia. So I think I just that's kind of given us a, a geographical location for where Isamila is. And what I'm just going to sort of set now is why I personally became interested in this in this site and it really goes back to my uh, undergraduate which I did at the University of Southampton and the uh, the lecturer at the time uh, John McNabb was giving a lecture on the Ashleyan and he showed a picture of these two hand axes in his lecture slides and as an undergraduate I sort of looked at them and thought oh those are very nice uh, hand axes you know I didn't have any really experience of what an Australian hand axe was at that time, way back in the early 2000s. And I guess, you know, like, like, like many in my class at the time, we didn't pay attention to the, the, the scale ruler that was located next to these hand axes. So when Mac then showed this next picture, my jaw sort of hit the floor about, wow, these are, these are, you know, these aren't just hand axes, but these are really, really exceptional hand axes. These are, these are giant hand axes. And I became really sort of interested at that point as to why would people be making these, these, sorts, these sorts of artifacts? Because my previous sort of impression of a hand axe is that they were, they were smaller artifacts, you know, that you held in your hand to, to use as a butchery tool. But, you know, from a superficial look, you know, these, these very, very large ones are, are perhaps not, not, not kind of functional in, in that respect. So I immediately ran out of that lecture into the library to try and find out more about Isamila. And that kind of then started a journey over the next 10 years or so where I would periodically sort of drop in trying to find papers, publications around the site, trying to gain sort of a bit of an overview of what work had been done there um, and, 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 and what it kind of all means. But part of the, the hook for Isamila is the fact that it seems to be one of these sites where you get these, or at least a, a number of large giant hand axes. And it might just be worth spending a few minutes to talking about what does a giant hand axe mean? Now, Kelly in 1959 published a sort of a, 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 an amalgamation of a data set from Europe and Africa for these giant hand axes. And he defines a, an, a giant hand axe as a, as a hand axe, an Australian hand axe that is over 27 centimeters long. So anything over 27 centimeters should be considered giant. Anything underneath um, would just be a, a normal hand axe, I guess, if you use that term. But it's a really, it's an arbitrary, it was an arbitrary number. There wasn't really anything behind that definition. It was just sort of a, it was just, just based on a, a series of, of, of a size uh, measurement. And in that 1959 paper, he, he sort of cataloged the number of, instances where giant hand axes have been found both in Europe and in Africa here and here and what emerges is that quite a lot of these giant hand axes do not come from secure context they tend to be isolated surface finds the kind of exceptions really are these three that were known about from Isamila at the time which seem to come from a stratified site and I've added in the Cuxton, Fikron and Cleaver found by Francis Wenban Smith, which, which also came from context in the early 2000s, I think it was 2004. What I do need to add to this diagram though, is the Amanzi Springs hand axes, uh, which Andy Herries and uh, Mac Caruana have been working on. Um, and I fortunately didn't have time to, to, to add the kind of dimensions in here, but clearly that's another really important site that's starting to emerge as to having sort of a, a number of these giant hand axes in context. But apart from those kind of three clear sites, in the publications, at least from 1959, 
almost all of these giant Hanex instances are single, isolated surface finds that don't really come from any context. And the impact of that means that we don't really understand then what a giant hand axe looks like in the context of the broader Acheleen assemblage. Are they genuinely exceptional in the context of a broader as assemblage based on their size, or are they part of a broad continuum um, where, where, where you're seeing sort of a, a gradual grading of things from smaller handheld objects to, to these larger ones? If we kind of look at the African sites just for a moment on their own, the red ones are the Assimila ones that which were pre-published by 1959. That, um, I, and I'll talk a little bit about the history of these three artifacts in a moment. Um, but during the course of our research, looking at um, the uh, museum archives in Dar es Salaam and the Field Museum in Chicago, we sort of identified, identified another 19 hand axes that came from Isamida that would fall under the definition of giants by Kelly. And what this means, really is that Isamila then starts to provide almost a unique position in, in publications, at least that I'm aware of. So if you are, if you have similar size artifacts, please let, let's talk about this at the end, because I think it's really important to try and get, you know, these sorts of things contextualized properly and see them within the context of their broader assemblages. Um, but Isamila becomes then one of the, these few sites in the world that have these large artifacts coming out of stratified context against the background of a broader assemblage, which means we, we actually might be able to understand the meaning of these artifacts. You know, are they overtly symbolic? Are they, or try, in terms of trying to send a message in a social cultural way, or are they still just very large functional objects? So this is my interest in Isamila. This is what kind of sparked the kind of the desire to, to want to know more about this site in particular, um, but also this kind of artifact, um, this, this kind of unusual art artifact within the Ashley and these, these large giant hand axes. So when I started kind of looking at the research and the publications that, that, um, that dealt with the Samila, I mean, it, it's a fairly famous site in terms of an East African early Stone Age context. Um, lots of publications reference the Samila, but there's actually relatively few publications that talk about the site in detail uh, and on its own. And th these publications are sort of largely summarized by what you can see on the screen, starting with Van Riet Lowe's publication 1951, and then most recently Kirsten Bergstrom et al's uh, publication in last year in this African uh, Journal of Science. Of those, these the ones in black are, archaeolog are archaeological publications. So they are ones dealing directly with the archaeology of Isamila. The orange ones sort of tend to deal a bit more with the broader context, including and sort of uh, look at Isamila artifacts in relation to, to other artifacts from other sites. And the blue ones tend to focus more on the geology of Isamila. But Isamila, you know, is a site that is often repeated in the East African Stone Age literature time and time again. So, you know, kind of when I realized in the early sort of 2010s that actually relatively little had been written and published uh, about, and I think the publication is the key thing here, which I'll return to later. You know, a lot of that has, has not really been updated since really the late 70s. So now I'll just give a bit of background in terms of the discovery of the site. Um, and the site was found by uh, a Mr. D. McLennan, uh, who was traveling uh, to St. Peter's School in Johannesburg from Nairobi. And he was traveling with the Mr. Lilly and they were heading south by road through Tanganyika. And they passed through Oringa um, and sort of then just roughly 12 miles south of that town, they spotted this erosion sort of gully that they wanted to explore a bit further. So they, it was accessible by cart track and there were wooden slopes. Uh, they used the South African term for erosion um, gully donga in this publication. And they sort of went down this track and, and onto the floor of this erosion gully, this donga, and discovered that there were several square foot uh, sort of contained signs of, of, of industry. And they collected more or less at random two rucksacks full of implements and they apologized to, to Van Riet Lowe, who they took them to, and Van Riet Lowe at that time was the head of the East African Archaeological Service, 
Um, so they, they apologized to him for the uns unscientific approach to the site, but they collected these two rucksackfuls of artifacts. And within those two rucksacks uh, were, these, were these two artifacts here, number one and number four in this image. And indeed, these are the two giant hand axes that I showed you earlier with the ruler scale next to them. And Mac is holding this one up next to his head to show the size. And, and these two hand axes are currently um, uh, residing at the University of Wittgenstrom, I think, in their collections. So, you know, within these two rucksacks, they had these uh, two hand axes of enormous size, one and four, which were struck from large side struck flakes. And the, they were uncommon, uncommonly large hand axes. Um, so Van Riet Lowe, that, that's the kind of first publication detailing the discovery and the fact that there's, you know, highlighting that there's potential here for, 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 for further work. And what he sort of laments really is that, um, I'm just going to try and move this video slightly out the way if I can. Um, okay. Um, so he says, uh, Mr. McLennan did not attempt to trace the implements to their geological horizons in the walls of the Donga and did not therefore note any stratification. I cannot escape the suspicion that there may well be <coughs> a stratified sequence of at least three cultural horizons. This site, which according to the discoverer is strikingly rich in remains, appears to be a miniature uh, Oldupai gorge. So Van Riet Lowe, kind of the 19, early 1950s, off the back of this collection by Mr. McLennan and Mr. Lilly and these two rock sets, recognizes that this may be a significant uh, early Stone Age site and well worth the investigation. Uh, future investigation. Clark Howell, uh, who at that time had, was sort of spending time in South Africa and talking to Van Riet Lowe, um, then sort of takes on the mantle of wanting to find out more about the site and takes an initial trip up to uh, the Isamida Donga. He does a rough uh, sketch map in relation to the Iringa Escarpment and the Raha River, showing the north and sort of south gullies. And he takes some initial photographs showing some of the geological formations here and then um, the, the, the archaeological, the kind of the northern branch where these artifacts are on the ground and recognizes that, you know, there's, there's some in situ material here and some bone. Uh, he, Clark Cow uh, also uh, collects um, some artifacts from the site. Some 90 hand axes were collected, uh, most frequently made on side struck flakes, uh, roughed out with the stone on stone technique, so hard hammer technique and later trimmed with a bone or wood since a soft hammer technique. Some specimens are only roughly trimmed with hard hammer and were apparently utilized in that state. Hand axes range in size from a diminutive uh, sort of 12 centimeters uh, in, in porphyrite to elongated up to 18 to 25 centimeters in length. The largest example is a massive roughly trimmed specimen about 36 centimeters long, 14 inches, made from a nodule of uh, porphyrite the size of which obviously defies the Appalachian hand axe. So I think, you know, at this point, you know, that's now three large hand axes, uh, giant hand axes that have been recognized from the site. And it's these three that make their way into Kelly's 1959 uh, publication. So we start to recognize that Isamina is a major Stone Age site with a range of artifacts present on a range of raw materials. And Clark Hall also starts to draw comparisons to Oltapai Gorge and Olakasai uh, for classic sequences in Eastern Africa, but also talks about Clark's recent discoveries at Kalambo Falls. And he starts to see that Isamila might be playing a role kind of linking these two different uh, extremes of the, of, of the Rift Valley um, in a kind of north-south direction um, and starting to fill in gaps on the map there. So from that initial um, publication, 1955, the next publication, archaeological publication about Isamila occurs in 1961. And this 1961 publication in Scientific American is a, is a popular uh, science communication piece off the back of um, three or four seasons of excavation occurring at Isamila during the late, during the late 1950s. And within this scientific uh, American paper, that's when we start to see the first estimates about date and age for Isamila. So in, in the current framework in the 1960s, uh, obviously we, we know now that the Echelene is much older than 300,000 years, but in the 1960s, uh, current estimates place the beginning of that Echelene around 300,000 in the middle of the Pleistocene and the end at about 75,000 years ago, toward the end of the last interglacial period. 
This is Clark Howe's kind of um, summary. Judging by the geological formations represented there, Isimila seems to have been inhabited for only a few thousand years near the end of the long span. Sorry, I'm just going to move the camera again if I can. Um, uh, sorry, during the long span uh, of that, I think it's Pleistocene. So Clark Howell starts to peg this site as being a young Achillean site, I think is the key thing to take away from that Scientific American paper. He also starts to publish really the first accurate site map, which we can see on the right hand side here. And within that site map, in these kind of red and, and, and orange uh, dashed and solid lines, starts to draw the limits of the five stratigraphic beds, beds one, two, three, four, and five. One being the youngest and five being the oldest at the base. And there's a couple of cross sections A, B, and C here showing you how the, these kind of beds relate to each other. And there's an aerial photograph of the site. You can see some of Clark House trenches here uh, located uh, in this northern branch. So what's happening is that Isimila is on an incline. So it's, it's sort of um, the northern end, uh, which is, if I wave my mouse at the top here, is higher, as a higher elevation. The southern end is at a lower elevation. And the erosion gully is cutting through these beds that have been laid down. The artifacts are really sort of eroding out, in, in many cases, Clark Howe would say in situ, um, out of those beds. So they, they kind of appear as surface finds, but in situ surface finds around these various beds that they are kind of eroding down out of. Um, Clark Howe also highlights that it's not just stone tools that are present, but there are, there are large faunal. So here's the remains of, hip, of a hippop hip, hippopotamus. And there are uh, these hand axes that he considers to be in situ uh, and deliberately placed on their edge, edge facing upwards, as, as in this picture, Clark Howell suggests that these, how they were deliberately placed in the ground, um, however many thousands of years ago. And when you go to a similar now, you can see the remains of sort of what are called museum floors, which are areas that were left in situ by Clark Howell and kind of had and fenced off for protection um, so that people could, could come and see these kind of in situ artifacts. Um, unfortunately, um, over the intervening kind of 60 to 70 years, these, these museum floors are no longer in situ, I would say. They, they've been disturbed and you certainly can't, you don't see the kind of wealth of, of faunal material like you, like you see in this photograph and you can't see hand axes sort of coming out um in, in in this sort of um, positioning but i think what was for me what struck me when i was there is that actually this was you know clark Howe leaving these museum floors in situ for future scholars but also visitors to see the nature of these things was was actually quite forward thinking in many respects in terms of trying to communicate and engage uh, people at the site um in the kind of the the incredible potential of the the the, the material that's there in the Scientific American paper, he also highlights sort of a brief rough down of the uh, sort of um, structure of the assemblages that were excavated. So you've got your hand axes, uh, cleavers, knives, scrapers, discoids, cores, picks and so on, and down to small flakes. And you can see that across the different, uh, these numbers here relate to the trenches and the grids, which I'll show you in a moment. But across the site really, from north to south, you start to see that there's a picture here of assemblages that are, I would say, complete or at least com comprising all the elements that you would want to see. So that, that it's not just hand axes, you're getting scrapers and cores and things at the same time. So flake tools as well as cores and debitage. So, you know, there's an element of in, of, of in situness here, um, which I think, you know, plays an important role for, for later interpretations. So that was the popular kind of um, uh, communication piece. In 1962, there's a more detailed interim site report that's published. And uh, this is unfortunately the, probably the, the last very detailed um, document about Isimila, although Colin Kleindice do also produce a, a, a follow-on paper, which is, which is very helpful in terms of understanding the, the stratigraphy. Um, but in 1962, you've got this inter interim report, which shows the, the northern branch. And on, the northern, on this uh, map, you can see that the, the, grid, the excavation grid, F, G, H, J, K at the base, and then the numbers of the locations are 2 to, to 24. So that's the site grid. And they left in uh, the, the, the core 
pegs uh, of the site grid on the site, um, hammered deep into the ground, and I think concreted in some cases. Um, if you, when you look for those site pegs now to reestablish the grid, they've actually been eroded out and pulled out. Um, so they, the actual, their location is no longer secure in terms of being able to reestablish this original grid. I just mention that because when I come to talk about some of the GIS work later, um, that that's probably as close as we'll get to the establishment of that original grid, I think, um, but happy to be proved wrong. And in that grid, you can see the location of the trenches. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see more of this map as we go through. Um, it's this 1962 publication that also lays out the broad um, sort of uh, stratigraphic context for the site. So you've got these broad beds, one, two, three, four, five, from top to bottom. And within that, there are some subdivisions. Um, but the, the detail of the sort of um, the, uh, the, the multiple contexts that might make up each bed is, is unfortunately lacking in this, in this publication. Although that, that was definitely recorded, as I'll show you from some of the site archives later on. So we still just got these kind of this broad view that is to me that has these five beds um, and you know, the youngest at the top, oldest, oldest at the bottom. Hansen and Keller did some work in the 1970s um, at Isamila, uh, and they, they dug a, a single new trench, K13. So you're still using the uh, Clark House um, grid system, um, K13, and sort of also did a, a, a sort of um, in that same paper looked at sort of the broad, broader geological context, which was also done in the interim report, but this was kind of the first. Um, published map of that geological report. Um, Haldeman's uh, original geological maps are really wonderful to see if you can, you know, um, and there, there are some original copies held in the museum in Dar es Salaam. Um, so, you know, the, all of that work is, is, has been done. Uh, Hansen and Keller just sort of um, simplified that and, and put, it, put it within their publication. And they also then produced um, a, a more detailed stratigraphic diagram still using these beds or sands one two three four five as broad units and although their sediment descriptions are a bit more detailed they still are are are, are, are vaguer than perhaps we would like uh, as a team returning you know so many years later and trying to re-establish those those stratigraphic horizons in 1972 there was a short paper in nature excuse me talking about um, the data, the, the, the U-series dating of a bone that came from layer four, so towards the bottom of the sequence, from G23. And G, G23 is in this group of trenches here. And, you know, that, that U-series date suggested that the bones there are around 260,000 years old. So, you know, if you remember back, the Scientific American publication suggested this might be a fairly young site towards the end of the Ashley in, in that current framework of understanding. A few years later in the, in the 70s, now suggesting that actually elements of the site might be much older in the 260,000 and, and not such a young site after all. Uh, Colin Kleindice, then in 1974, uh, published a really fantastic paper, Further Reflections on the Samila <coughs> Ashley. And, and you know, this, this, this paper really does probably the most to kind of clarify the stratigraphic relationships, looking at the Hansen and Keller stuff, as well as the original um, uh, publications in the, in the interim report, and you know, detail these beds, these sands, 1A, uh, 1, 1B, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, heading down, and, and sort of come closest to giving a detailed uh, description of those sedimentary beds. Um, but in terms of actually trying to replicate the, these divisions on site, we, we, we certainly struggle with that. And I'll, I'll explain more when I, when I show some of those photographs. They also produced a really useful um, sort of profile of the Semina Kronga. And you can see the, um, the, the, this is the northern end, this is the southern end, and it's declining down. So that at the northern end, the younger beds are exposed towards the surface. And as you head south, you get deeper into the sequence. Um, and so you can start to see um, beds one, two, and three towards the top, four and five at the, at, towards the base. Bed four, to remind you, is where that bone was dated around that 260,000 year old mark. And through typology in, in the kind of um, 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, 
they were, they were drawing similarities to Calambo Falls, which at that time was estimated to be about 60,000 years ago uh, for the upper beds one and two. So this starts to kind of draw a picture then of, of Isamila as sort of having a, a fairly complex um, history in terms of not just excavation wise, but actually also interpretation, but a phenomenal amount of work has gone into this single site to try and understand it um, uh, by, by, by multiple teams. But in terms of sort of summarizing the site formation processes, um, there's sort of two, two models really. One is that it's a possibly a fairly rapid accumulation over a few thousand years. So the sediments of the Isamina formation consist of a series of these shallow water deposits laid down in a lake or pond, occupying small enclosed basin within a pre-existing drainage line. And then as you get the seasonal drying, uh, reducing to marsh and so on, those erosional processes open up. And this picture here at the bottom of the side is actually uh, a local artist's interpretation of that which you can see in the Isamila Museum itself and the credit is, is, is hidden currently by, the, uh, by the, the, the video screen. But I think that's a, it's a really useful way to kind of visualize how the Isamila site it looks like as it does today in terms of the, the erosional process that have exposed these beds and but clearly you know these hominins in the past are there around these water, around a waterhole feature, presumably, on the edge of it, um, you know, sort of napping uh, and using their tools and, and depositing there in, in those structures. Okay, so in terms of dates, dating and the site, the date of about, this is Colin Kleindice 1974, 1974 paper, the date of, of 260,000 is rather older than we would have expected. And if, date, if this date is accepted, recognizing the fact the techniques used are uh, still regarded as problematic, uh, two possibilities may be considered. The Achillean occurrences of SANS-1 may be appreciably older than originally thought and of about the same age as the dated bone from SANS-4. This would be the case if the sediments had accumulated fairly rapidly as we had originally proposed. Alternatively, there may be much more time involved in the sedimentation of the Isamina formation than was first supposed. As Hansen and Keller have suggested, assuming that the ages of SANS-1 are on the order of 100,000 years, there is approximately 150,000 years to account for in the seven meters of sediment separating SANS-1 from the bone-bearing horizons in four and five. And they sort of conclude this section with dating that much you know, more work needs to be done to clarify this formation, the site formation process. And that's kind of, um, Subsequently, um, there's been a lot of work at Olokasai. I'm sure everyone will be familiar with this, where you've got uh, the dates for Olokasai ranging from 1.2 million to about 490,000 through Argon Argon dating, and Rick Potts's fantastic work there. And other work at Colombo Falls by Larry Barham and colleagues show four phases of deposition. And within their OSL dates for Colombo Falls from 2015, they suggest that maybe those um, those layers, those actually in layers, may be somewhere between 500 and 300,000 years ago. So, in terms of thinking about the dates of, of Isimila, against that broader context, some of these other site dates have been pushed back um, to, to older times than, than initially thought when they were, when they were first um, examined, in the same context of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And for Isimila, from that publication, uh, from, from published material, the age, I think, is still not certain. It could be old, it could be young, it could be a fast formation process, could be a longer formation process. And different teams will, will have to putting forward different theories about how that might work. The stratigraphy in terms of detail beyond those kind of broad designated bands of sands one, two, three, four, and five, is also kind of lacking that's the kind of specific detail that I'll show you actually what was definitely recorded by the excavating team. Um, and that perhaps has led to a bit of difficulty in, in us trying to reestablish what we think those beds are in relation to what the original excavators saw as those beds being. And in terms of the archeology, span you know, despite you know, the fact that Isimil was recognized as a really important site having some in-situ archaeology and these fantastic giant hand axes, 
there wasn't really ever that final publication that brought back, that brought the character of the archaeology together, you know, placing these giant hand axes clearly within the context of these broader assemblages that we see across these beds. And, it, and at least in my reading of them, and apologies if I've missed this, um, there wasn't really a clear idea coming out of those publications about where these large, these larger artifacts would have been. And that might be because, you know, you don't want to hook everything on a giant hand axe. I mean, we, we still don't really understand what the role of these giant hand axes played within the Ashleyan. Um, and undoubtedly, they would have played different roles in different cultural and social settings and different geographical contexts in which they were made. So there's an added, you know, complexity to our understanding of, the, of that archaeological record. But, you know, we still sort of try, try to contextualise the archaeology against the, the stratigraphy and the dating of the site a bit more was really the kind of um, prompt that I wanted to, to sort of try and, and come back to Isimila to try and see if there, if there was a way that we could add to our, to our, to our understanding of the site at all. So for that, um, you know, we had fairly limited funds and they were all of the field work that I'll describe here was done on on small grants, uh, taking teams out really only for the maximum of about a week, maybe a week and a half, I think was the longest we spent uh, in, in Adesimila. And what we were just trying to do was take uh, dating samples and clarify the stratigraphy and try and locate some of these assembly, you know, some, some of the assemblages that we'd seen in the museums back to their to, to their to, to the beds of origin and try and reconstruct the original um, site publications really. So we want to try and understand how old the site was, whether the site formation processes were long or short, try and clarify the detailed stratigraphy uh, of the site through a geo-archaeological approach, but also look at the how collections based in Dar es Salaam and, and the Chicago Field Museum in order to kind of inform future project bids. I mean, as we all know, archaeology is a, is a, is a destructive process and, and excavation is a, is a destructive process. So, and I'm very much of the ethos that if the stuff has been excavated, we should, we should make the most of that excavated material before looking to excavate again and make sure that we really understand what we've already extracted from a site before, before kind of going in and, 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 and digging down and, and, and destroying the context of these things even further. And we also wanted to try and conduct a preliminary raw material analysis on, on artifacts to, to, get, to try and get a bit of an understanding about, you know, whether raw materials for, for the range of hand axes seen there were uh, found locally or transported in over a, a longer distance. And we had kind of four phases really over two years of conducting this, which involved both fieldwork at Isimila and museum visits in Dar es Salaam and, uh, and, and and Chicago at the Field Museum. And I'm, I'm just sort of going to summarize now a bit some of the, um, the finds. Now in Dar es Salaam, um, the Isimila material is kept with the, uh, with the old Dupai uh, material that Ignacio de la Torre has looked at and catalogued and, 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 and organized um, extensively. So it, you know, it was a real honor to be able to kind of look at the Isimila stuff, but also kind of sneak a, a peek where, where, where I could on some of the, on the old Dupai material. But kept separate from the main Isimila um, um, sort of uh, artifacts was this artifact, which I'm holding in my hand. And what's happened, unfortunately, within the, the Dar es Salaam um, archive is that the, the artifact numbering in terms of the grid location and the context that it all comes from has sort of come off a number of the artifacts. Um, so it's very hard to, to kind of use that museum assemblage and, re and relate it back to what context it came from. This, this artifact that I'm holding in my hand, this giant hand axe with the broken tip that you can see, and if I just pull up um, the son of the first face, uh, the, dorsal view and the ventral view, you can see it's on a large side struck flake. Um, this wasn't kept with the main Isimila material, but the museum curators said, look, you've got to come and see this because it is from Isimila. And, um, you know, the label had come off, but it was certainly very much in the style of, of, the, of the Isimila material that I'd seen at, at Dar es Salaam. And I suspect that, you know, 
there, if you remember, I said that there were three large hand axes that were found from Isimila. Uh, two of them were in, uh, are currently in Vitz, and then there was that mysterious third one that was about, that was 36 centimeters long. Well, on the basis that, you know, this certainly doesn't look out of kilter for some of the Isimila large hand axes, which I'll show you later on. The labeling does seem certainly very similar, and it is 36 centimeters long. Part of me wonders whether this is that third giant hand axe that Clark Hal had found and that it had stayed in, in Tanzania, um, uh, you know, as part of that initial collection. But it's so, so it's sort of very exciting to see, to see this artifact, um, uh, but also slightly disheartening in that we couldn't clearly use the Dar es Salaam Museum assemblage uh, relate because the provenance of many of those artifacts had been had had come off uh, the labels had come off and we, we couldn't we couldn't relocate them unfortunately the field museum the the original site labels were still present so we can we can relate those back to the, the site excavation grid and if you can do that you can relate them back to their stratigraphic context because you've got uh, the beds eroding out at different elevation levels uh, through the site and these are some of the uh, these are some of the the two of the other sort of large or giant hand axes, um, you know, sort of hand axe and a, and a giant cleaver um, that I found within that that process. Now, with, within all of the kind of museum research on this, um, Mac likes to tease me because the ones that fits are still the largest hand axes from from Miss Amila. and so he's definitely. I've ne I've never seen those ones that fits. I'd love to one day, um, but but he has. Uh, but the one thing that I do have over my old supervisor is the fact that I have seen the largest core found at Isimila. So this is in the Field Museum and this is a, a you know, a giant core. You can see these large uh, flake removals here coming off. So it, it must be a boulder of this sort of size that these large hand axes are coming off of. And what's interesting is that almost all of them are large side struck uh, flakes. Okay. So that's some of the context about the publications, uh, some of the detail about some of the museum pieces and the condition that they're in. What I'll do now is just show you some pictures of Isimila itself, uh, some of the artifact floors, and I'll show you the locations where we did some of our, our OSL dating, those results and kind of uh, where we can move for the future. So in each of the next few photographs, the red box is showing where I'm standing to take the photograph and the red arrows showing the direction that the photograph is looking um, across the landscape. Okay, so I'm standing here up at the campsite that we were staying at, uh, just standing above looking out over uh, Isimila for this next photograph. So here you can see Isimila Hill, and in the, in the foreground you can see the white sands of the northern uh, Donga. And this, I think, is a useful photograph just to kind of set the actual landscape context of Isimila. It's at the base, it's at the end really of a long valley that heads all the way up at the top of this valley you can see the Oringa escarpment in the distance so it's a natural kind of funnel uh, for animals and, and, and humans I would say kind of moving through these landscapes and this waterhole being towards the, uh, the, the lower end um, because it's on a, a gentle sort of southern uh, decline and the waterhole being here banked up against this Amida hill really um, so there's a sort of a natural ch channeling in the landscape of animals and, and people, I think, to, to these kind of, uh, to, to, to these erosional gullies that we are seeing today. Okay, so here are just um, a, a GIS map of some of the, the important locations that we identified in our 20 um, sort of an initial scoping exercise in 2014. Um, and the red box, sorry, is, is pointing down here under the screen. So I'm just sort of looking at the southern branch here, showing some of these amazing geological formations. So you can see these eroding uh, geological formations in this southern branch. What's quite striking, if I just go back, is that there's very little archaeology in the southern branch. Very little. There's a few uh, Middle Stone Age flakes that we identified from this kind of confluence of these two branches, but very, very little archaeology here. No, nothing really other than a few flakes uh, out of context that I've really seen. Almost all of the astonishing archaeology I'll show you is from this northern branch and heading down into this kind of main erosion channel. 
Okay, so here, um, the next photograph I'll show you is uh, coming down from the steps from the museum, looking north, looking north up the kind of erosion, um, the, the Krongo, uh, to, to kind of give you an idea of what this, this context looks like. This is an old uh, mine which um, uh, was used to kind of create the, the tarmac, the asphalt road that the, the is the, now the main route down to Zambia. So this is looking north um, across the erosion gully. You can start to get a, a, a character for the actual uh, Karongo itself and the beds as they're formed. I'm just going to show you now sort of a picture of some artifact concentrations that we've seen. Um, so you can clearly see here some cleavers, hand axes. Um, not every one of these stones is, is a worked artifact, but a lot of them are, if not most of them. And you know this sort of sc scattering of artifacts across the Karongo floor is fairly typical uh, of this northern branch. So there's, there's a huge volume of material still here, still eroding out, um, as well as the, the, the significant numbers that have been excavated uh, already. Um, this next photograph is kind of showing the location of the G23 trench, which is where the bone was dated, the 260,000 year old bone was dated from level four. It was my initial hope that we would be able to locate, relocate G23 and do our OSL dating uh, in the same block of sediment so that we could have a, a, a comparison uh, to work against. Uh, here's a photograph from the, from the HAL archive, 1957-58, showing uh, the G23 excavations. Uh, this red box is what I think is, is what now remains at the site. What's really astonishing is that Almost all of these excavation trenches from the, the, from, from the HAL work in the late 50s, there is almost no evidence, visible evidence of it in the, in, in the Isimila Karonga today. You, you really cannot tell where, where the excavations occurred, other than these kind of fenced off museum floors, which are now no longer in situ and, and quite disturbed. So here's um, the G23 block, which I think is what's remaining. And I think it's that back end from that uh, archive photograph. And the reason why we didn't end up sampling here is that we just didn't think there was enough of a sequence that we could um, confidently attribute to a, a clear bed, uh, you know, four and five. Um, uh, and it wasn't a continuous sequence from, from one to five either. So we ended up not, um, not putting our OSL samples here. But what I'm pointing at is sort of some in situ uh, bone fragments and chips that are still eroding out. So they, you know, there's still um, faunal material, I think, to be discovered as well as artifactual uh, material to, 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 to be looked at. This next block of um, photographs and areas I'm going to show you is where we ended up did, is where we did put our, our OSL dating um, section. And we, we managed to sort of locate it uh, close to a, a, a well, it, was known as the G18 trench and the G18 cliff section. Uh, and this map that you can see where these, these locations are made are from the 1961 to 62 interim report. So here's the location of our, um, our two sections. We end up doing two sections, 14A and 14B. And across these two sections, we managed to get an overlap uh, you know, from the Holocene deposits at the top, uh, down into beds, uh, to top one, two, three, and into the top of four. And then on this surface, we had uh, bottom of three, uh, four, and into five. So between these two uh, sort of um, overlapping sections, we managed to get the whole, the whole, the whole sequence. In the, in, I think we, we only had about three or four days to do this dating. Um, if you can just sort of, if I just draw your attention to this flat piece of ground here for a moment, um, and which you can see in, in the foreground of this photograph, we think that, unfortunately, from the, from the HAL archive, they showed a, a picture of the G18 location, uh, which is here, prior to excavation, but there wasn't then a photograph showing the actual, where the G18 trench went in this photograph. So it's a little bit hard to relocate where G18 trench, where the G18 trench actually was. I think this tree might be playing an important role uh, uh, and I'll bring our attention back to it in, in my photographs in a moment. This is the tree up here that I was just highlighting in that previous, I think this is the same, the same tree and I'm, I'm being very cautious with this, but I think it's quite um, odd that you've got this kind of flat cut um, 
within within this section. So I wonder if this is the G18 trench and we've managed to sort of put our two sections um, directly above that G18 work. Uh, there's, I can't get it any more accurate than that in terms of the GIS um, realignment that we did. And it, I think it might be a question that's open unless um, I'm hoping to maybe try and talk to Mac Maxine Kleindeist in, in the not too distant future and see if I can show her some of these pictures and we can talk about whether G18 was actually located there. Um, but at the moment, this is kind of my best guess resolution. So here are our, um, uh, this is 2014 when we took our OSL samples and you can see we took about 16 samples. Uh, you can just see the black caps poking out across these different uh, sections. And I just want, kind of wanted to show you just, you know, that this is an active erosion gully still and um, the, the amount of erosion each year is, I think, varies, but it's still sort of fairly significant. So in 2014, we cleaned these back and, and took our OSL samples. Uh, here in 2015, you can see um, this is what it looks like. So, you know, 14A is almost invisible. I mean, you can just about, when you're very close, you can see where you can see the ends of our OSL tube sampling, but otherwise, um, you know, that, that's gone. And you can just see the the ends of the, o, of the OSL tube uh, samples here where we dug them out in the 14B section. But just in one year, um, you know, the er erosional processes here all really kind of eradicated any presence that we had on the site. And you can also see this collapse here, which I'll show you in a moment. So here's the 2014. Uh, here are hand axes eroding uh, out of context, uh, clearly being undercut. Uh, in the rainy season, uh, this erosional gong, uh, um, Karonga floods uh, quite significantly and uh, the, uh, the museum um, uh, curator and uh, people who work on the site uh, taking the, the tours around say that this can you know these floods can sort of be several meters deep in, in, in some of the flash uh, incidences. So here's a here's that section in 2014 and in 2015 you can see that that's sort of been that's collapsed um, and you know the, the, the context of all those artifacts is, has, has will be lost and these processes are occurring uh, year on year. So against that kind of erosional background, it's not surprising that there's no real evidence left of the Clark Hall excavation trenches. And it's also perhaps not surprising that these concrete posts that have been cemented to establish the baseline of the grid have also been ripped up and eroded out because there's a huge, there, there's a, you know, there's a lot of force happening here um, from an erosion perspective every year. Okay, so from our OSL, from our sections, uh, we obviously recorded uh, the context very closely. Uh, here's a, a log of, of our two section fronts. And we think we have identified the Holocene deposits of uh, what's called the Mbunga, as well as then the bed one, the bed two, the bed three, bed four, and bed five, um, continuing sort of under the, under the video um, um, screens. What you can all, and, oh, sorry, from, just a reminder, this is, these are the published kind of um, designations from Cole and Kleindeist. Um, and from that, you know, you, you can get a very, perhaps false impression that these delineations of beds are very clear at this amoeba. We, we really struggled in terms of trying to reestablish these, these bed designations um, against this kind of um, detailed stratigraphic context that we had recorded. In the HAL 50s excavations, the, these detailed um, sort of stratigraphic um, sections were also recorded by, by them, by the team. But what's not clear from any of them, and I, and I kind of, I mean, I only had a few days to look at the archive material, but what I could see, I couldn't see anywhere within those field notebooks where the, the you know, how the beds or the sands, one, two, three, four, and five, related to these very detailed um, uh, stratigraphic recordings. So, you know, when we talk about the reestablishment of these layers, um, this is our best guess, really. Um, and, um, and, and this was work led by Martin Bates, um, sort of a, using that kind of a, a, a geo, geoarchological approach. Okay, so some of the results of the dating then from these two sections and, and, and the two samples. Oh, Sorry, before I get there, this is just uh, me trying to reestablish 
and from the photograph what those sands uh, beds one to five might look like. So this is the Imbunga or the Holocene deposits at the top of the sequence. Bed one occurs here, two, we think three then uh, spanning uh, our two, um, two sections, uh, four and five is this kind of greeny color at the base which you can see just under here. So that's how they kind of the beds look on the photograph and I kind of best fits and then just looking at the sequence because you know in in the publication reports layer four is particularly important because that's where you have bone coming out that's the 260,000 uh, layer that was dated through the uranium series and this that's the layer that we think you've got these artifacts eroding out of context here uh, so bed three four and five at the base uh, we also looked at uh, particle size and we, we did some resistivity on the section to see if that might show, show up any clear patterns um, and we've used these to, to try and inform our beds one, two, three, four and five um, refits back to um, th these kind of detailed stratigraphic context layers. Uh, but really nothing too characteristic coming out uh, in terms of differences um, across the, the beds really that we could con concretely pull out. Um, we did a very basic level survey uh, across the length of the, uh, the, the northern branch um, uh, to try and sort of just in our own minds see if we could map out uh, where beds one and two stopped out cropping, three, four and five and try and in an attempt to try and relate these back to those um, uh, simplified geological diagrams that I showed you coming from that 1961 Scientific American uh, publication. And what you can see here, just, just, just popping up from the base here, is kind of our, our sub layer five a deposit emerging up. And, and in, and in the uh, Colin Klein Dice in the 1961 uh, interim publications, this subunit below layer five is what's blocking <coughs> that north, what's now the northern branch, creating the water hole. And at some point in antiquity, that layer is breached, which leads to the draining of the Karonga and, and the water holes uh, that don't, uh, don't appear in the same way. So we're thinking that, you know, actually in terms of profile, we, we, we can kind of match this to Colin Klein Dice um, re relatively confidently, I think. Okay, now in terms of the dates, just to remind people that the 1972 paper um, and in Colin Klein, 1974, you've got this U series on the bone of 260,000 down in bed four. And then by uh, typological comparison, um, you know, ass assuming that beds one and two are around between 75 and 60,000 years ago, based on that comparison to Calambo Falls. Now, of course, uh, Larry Barnes' work at Calambo Falls suggests that um, those layers may well be much older. But what about our OSL dates? Um, well, our OSL dating was not as successful as we would like. So um, there's some red dates. Let me try and move this again if I can. Um, oh. It's, it's, it's very clear. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Shanti. So the, um, the red dates are OSL dates that are saturated. So uh, they are over range and they, they are probably at best would, would, would provide minimum dates. The blue are ones that are, have come out with a, a greater degree of confidence. And what you can see here is that, you know, if the OSL dates are to be believed, these blue um, dates would suggest maybe a very young and quick formation process for these upper, upper beds, beds one, the sort of um, beds one and two. I highlight the 65,000 plus or minus 6K date here and the one in bed three to, to show that, you know, I'm not very confident in these OSL dates really. Um, and, and, and certainly when I talk about this with colleagues and things, there's a feeling that these are still too young. <laughs> if we kind of take a, a, a kind of a, a gut instinct by looking at, looking at some of the archeology span that's presented there. Uh, it might be that these saturated dates, these minimum dates in red, might be a, a better reflection for the dates or for, 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 for a similar, but I think that an awful lot of, of work still needs to be done on, on, on the dating, but I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Let me just come back. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll just briefly shoot run through some of the PXRF, uh, the portable x-ray fluorescence analysis that we did. This was trying to sort of um, scan artifacts held in the Dar es Salaam um, assemblage uh, for Isimila and then going to Isimila and scanning rock outcrops uh, in the immediate vicinity to see if there was any chance of, of, of a match on this PXRF analysis. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that Professor uh, David Nash, who I don't know if people have seen the, the Stonehenge provincing work that's come out just two days ago, uh, but this is him with the PXRF um, um, uh, at, at the Similar Outcrops and, and John McNabb uh, doing them. Okay, um, so in terms of the, um, the our sample sites, uh, around the Similar here we have the north and south um, uh, branches. Uh, we've got granite diorites and, and granite and diorites uh, to sort of towards the east and west and metamorphics here towards the north, the northwest and the Similar Hill. So we, all of these squares represent sample sites uh, that was, were, were, were uh, the, the PXRF uh, was used against. Uh, we then plotted those sample sites against the artifact distribution and which you can see the, the crosses represent the artifacts and the uh, the solid colors represent the um, uh, the, uh, the the outcrops that we sampled so what you can see is that nine so dolerites uh, three ignimbrites and four uh, the altered granites don't as yet and I, I say as yet, uh, because our artifact sample size was not as extensive as we would want it to be. So I'm, I'm not ruling out these, these outcrops, but at least in the ones that we sampled, don't seem to feature within the artifact spread. If you actually zoom in on the artifact spread against the outcrop samples, you can see that there's, there's no clear correlation uh, to, to, to these, um, to, to where the artifact raw material signatures are versus the outcrops that are there. And where there, there is some, it's still too jumbled. And we really need to do a lot more fine-grained analysis. And I think now that Dave has, has finished his Stonehenge paper, I'll be um, reminding him that, that we, need to, we need to do a much more detailed analysis on the Isimila uh, samples as well. But what we might cautiously infer from this very limited sample um, of artifacts is that you know, these local sources here of the dolerites, uh, the alter granites, um, and, and the ignimbrite may not be the, um, the, the sources for those artifacts. But that's very cautious and I uh, say so it's a very small sample. I mean, I'm quite happy with our spread of samples around Isimila. We, 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 we know, um, we went to great pains to kind of get at every outcrop that we could see really. Um, uh, and, and using um, also uh, talking to, 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 to local um, uh, to, 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 to locals who, who knew the area very well to take us to these outcrops. So I'm, I'm confident with our, our kind of geological sampling, but I, I fully appreciate our artifactual sampling is very, very limited. So I'm not sure there's much we can say about it at the moment. In terms of, re, of, of locating the uh, Isimila giant hand axes, in terms of their context, you know, do they come from beds one, uh, two, three, four, or five? Uh, I've done some GIS work. Um, and here are some of the, um, uh, these 19 giant hand axes and the giant core from, that are held at the Field Museum in Chicago. There weren't many large hand axes like this in the Dar es Salaam uh, sample. Uh, so that's why I've, I've sort of focused on these. And if you've sort of read anything that I've written, I spent quite a large amount of my, uh, through my PhD and subsequent publications, talking about how hand axes aren't really symmetrical, or at least if they are, they're not symmetrical in great numbers within assemblages. And then yet here at Isimila, we have some of the most beautiful and symmetrical hand, giant hand axes I've ever seen in my life. Um, so kind of... <laughs> kind of um, sort of makes me perhaps start to question some of my, my, my earlier thoughts around the, the presence of symmetry within these assemblages. But I mean, there are some really remarkable pieces here and they are really, really stunning. Um, what I managed to do is go through the archive and get the um, grid references for each of those uh, artifacts, uh, except for two, which are these ones in gray where it wasn't clear. 
um, and these were just sort of surface finds. But the greens are the dark greens are, are I'm sort of very, very confidently able to to place the location of the artifacts against the original site grid, and the pale green is that large core uh, that was in the Field Museum archive. So what I then did is I sort of using GIS. Uh, Here's the uh, the site grid on the Korong, uh, from the Congo with the with the excavations, and here's the geology uh, map showing the outcropping of the beds one and two. Uh, using GIS, I uh, rectified um, and located the uh, 1961 site map against um, satellite imagery, and I used um, I used. Uh, all at sort of as far back as I could go in terms of the satellite and aerial photographs to try and so that the uh, the matches to the um, to, to, to the 1961 map uh, the, the erosional processes that have occurred over the last 60 years w w the the impact of those on the shape of the Kronka would be minimized and this is kind of my best fit option where the, the site grid is relocated against uh, the trench locations and some of the, the, the features there. I then plotted the uh, location of the giant core in yellow and then hand axes uh, against that site grid in GIS, uh, which you can see against this, air, this kind of aerial photograph uh, for Isimila. And you can start to see that there's a concentration up towards the northern end, and then you get these artifacts appearing towards the south and a very large one down here at this confluence. If you then overlay that against the uh, outcropping of the of where beds one, two, three, four, and five occur, you can see that most of these giant hand axes seem to come from beds one and two at the top end. So I suspect that this is where they are eroding from. And then the instances of these larger hand axes, uh, as you move south through the Karonga, have are where the um, are where uh, erosional forces have moved these artifacts down. Uh, so I think these are these giant hand axes are predominantly linked to these upper beds rather than the lower beds four and five. Uh, other recent work, uh, so Kirsten Bergstrom and team, uh, you know, we, we as part of our work there, we really wanted to go back and, and, and do a drone survey and try and accurately map um, the Assimila, um uh, uh, erosional gully, but we, we just couldn't get the funding to do that. But fortunately, Kirsten and her team did, and they produced a really uh, great publication, and you know, really fantastically have made their their um, their, their, their data uh, for the um, uh, the reconstruction of the of the Ismila, uh, Kor uh Korongo uh, available as open source data as part of this publication. So um, they've gone back, they've scanned it uh, with, 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 with drone flights and produced uh, now some really interesting and detailed maps of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Karonga as it stands today. And they've also uh, managed to geo, uh, sort of rectify some of these older um, uh, clock house grids on there. And I think actually uh, our, uh, we agree uh, quite a lot in terms of our, our, um, our, our mapping there. Um, so this is great. Uh, Martin Bates uh, has also gone back recently in the last year. I don't have any results to show you, but he's also done a more detailed survey over sections of, of the Simila uh, using a, an aerial drone. So we'll be able to get a finer grain resolution for for for, for, for Isimila as it stands. And I think being able to use uh, Kirsten's data uh, as well as Martin's when, he, when that's finished being processed, we'll be able to see just even in a year or two, the level of erosion or threat uh, present at the site. But, you know, Isimila itself is one site in, in a broader context. And typically when we look at the Stone Age sites of Africa, of Eastern and Southern Africa, as shown by Sarah Wirtz in 2014, you know, you've got a conglomeration of sites in the Rift Valley, in Kenya and into Ethiopia, and you've got a conglomeration of sites in Southern Africa. There's very few sites mentioned sort of in the Tanzanian Southern Highlands, Malawi, Mozambique, or Zimbabwe. Um, and there's this band, you know, Isimila's here, just, uh, I know it's very hard to see on the screen, but here you've got Isimila's location. But I think, you know, there's a lot more to be said for these regions. And this is kind of where I want to kind of broaden out my scope a bit more. Um, the Iringa Region Archaeological Project led by uh, Pamela Willoughby and colleagues has done some really fantastic work over the last 14 years, where they've identified 67 new archaeological sites. So here's Iringa. 
uh, Isamila is one of these dots in here. Um, and they've worked extensively around this region. And what they've identified are 14 early Stone Age sites uh, with, you know, Ashelian sites. Um, and I think they, they kind of tend to map on to, to these white specks of sand, which we've also seen in the aerial photos and the satellite imagery and wanted to, to explore in more detail. But unfortunately, we, we just didn't have the time or the funds to do that. But the IRAP project did. And they've identified these 14, these, these blue crosses, if you see them on the map, uh, early Stone Age sites around the Iringa region, including Isimida. Uh, 28 middle, middle Stone Age sites, again, these blue crosses in this image. So that's showing prepared core um, working uh, in, a, in a Lavawa fashion. Um, 36 later Stone Age sites. And um, although it's slightly outside my period, I thought I, we should show it for completeness sake, 51 Iron Age sites. So you know, this is a phenomenal project that's really, I think, emphasizes the potential of just the Oringa region for future archaeological exploration. It's not just about Isimila. This is just, this happens to be the, the most well-known site, early Stone Age site from that area, based, you know, I think in part due to these giant hand axes. Uh, but there are lots of others out there that, you know, need to be explored and understood at a broader landscape level. So just to kind of wind up the talk now, um, I think Despite the aims of the project that I, you know, we'd hope to kind of clarify some of the, the dating resolution, I think it still remains uncertain. I think it would be, we would be very hard pressed and foolish to kind of make any definite claims that this was a young Ashleyan site, possibly less than 100,000 years old. I don't think we can say that for certain. So, you know, there needs to be more work on the dating and a greater range of techniques. And I know Andy Harry spoke in this, um, in this seminar series um, a few weeks or months ago, um, and he's had some great success at Amanzi Springs with his, with, you know, with his dating techniques. So I think, you know, we're hopefully going to get into a discussion and see if we can come together and try some of this dating at Isimila. The position of the giant hand axes when plotted against the uh, reconstructed site grid seems to suggest they come from the upper bed, so the younger part of that's of the sequence. And I think, you know, when I come to the food for thought section, if we've got time, uh, that will be more important. But it's, you know, these giants aren't, don't seem, I don't think, to be coming from the beds four and five sequences. And certainly from the museum collections that I've seen, the four and five, the character of those assemblages is very different to the um, to these giant hand axes. Um, much more of a typical actually in sequence. In terms of moving forward, I mean, I think we really need to broaden the research collaborative base around Isamila at not just an international level, but a national, regional and site level and really kind of work to bring uh, these different scales of project teams together. And, you know, we're in preliminary discussions with colleagues in America and Tanzania at the moment about how we might do that. Because um, I think, you know, this is a site and a landscape that really has a lot more to, to, to say. And we need to continue the dating program incorporating our, our alternative methods. We need to still more accurately map the sediments and beds across the whole, the whole Karongo in, in detail. And particularly in relation to in situ artifacts that are eroding out of context and, and, and under threat. And it would be good to try and sort of, if there is going to be any excavation work, maybe we need to, we need to focus on these kind of rescue operations a bit more. And there's a lot more to do with the PXRF results. We need to analyze a, a, a much larger number of artifacts than we have done. And maybe sort of focus on distinctive raw materials uh, in the landscape. Interestingly, uh, Maxine Kleindice was very kind enough to offer an opinion that you know, when they were excavating the site, they thought that maybe raw material uh, uh, sources were, were from the Karongo itself. Now, certainly there's that large core that I showed you from the Field Museum that was found uh, in, 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 in the Isimila Northern Branch. And when we were doing the OSL dating sections, we did find another large core uh, that had sort of fallen out of context. We don't know where it came from. Uh, it was just on the 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 the, the, the bed the, of the um, of the um, of, of the Isimila Karongo. But there are certainly large cores there, and you know these cores are they are very big and they are very heavy. So you know if you're napping these large hand axes, you're not moving these cores great distances across the landscape. I think because you know the hand axes themselves are heavy, and that that core. 
um, that I showed you the picture of. I mean, I, I really took two of us to move it. It could barely lift it on my own. And I think also, you know, in terms of the broader blue sky thinking that, that, that this kind of feeds into is clearly the Southern Highlands of Tanzania, uh, you know, the IRAP project demonstrates that this is not, these are not empty Stone Age landscapes, okay? They are people there, it's just sites have not been recognized or published in, 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 in wider detail, although probably clearly recognized by the people, you know, people who, who live there. So I think we need to engage uh, a lot more with, with, local, with, with local populations and teams to, to kind of, um, increase our knowledge base and, and kind of understanding about the Stone Age of these areas because clearly you know, the Southern Highlands in Tanzania, Zam Zambia, Malawi and Northern Zimbabwe and Mozambique are not absent of these Stone Age archaeology sites. They are there uh, and they are known about. It, just the maps are not kind of flagging them up. So we need to kind of, it would be great to kind of engage in a really ambitious project you know, across multiple research teams in these regions to try and fill these gaps in the maps and see, see what other amazing Stone Age sites. And I think particularly early Stone Age sites are, are present there because uh, they, they must be there. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that they are. Um, so I just have a few acknowledgements. So here's the team from 2015 uh, at the end and sort of some funding uh, from the University of Brighton, uh, working with the society, uh, with Costec and the Department of Antiquities in Tanzania and the National Museum uh, in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam. Um, I can end there, or I, I have just a few more slides, just to kind of food for thought, what, what's if? Would, pe would people be interested in seeing those, or I can also have to stop? Oh, absolutely, please continue. Okay, uh, thanks. So I just kind of, the next few slides, I just kind of want to think, okay, you know, I've acknowledged that the dating the OSL dating is young and, I, and I, I, I'm not terribly confident in it. And, you know, and more work needs to be done and I suspect it is almost certainly going to be older. But just as a, a sort of a bit of a thought experiment, I thought it might be interesting to think, you know, well, what if, what if those young dates are true? What if that initial sort of um, comment by Clark Howell that, you know, the feeling that he had that this was a young Ashleyan site towards the end of the Ashleyan period, is true and what happens you know and, and these giant hand axes if they are confined to these beds one and two at the top of the sequence and have kind of a, a potentially young age less than a hundred thousand years maybe around sixty thousand what are the implications of that in terms of our broader understanding of human uh, sort of evolution uh, and, and how do we inter how could we possibly interpret that well even just 10 years ago human evolution seemed to be fairly sim simply understood, okay? There was uh, Homo erectus evolving in Africa, moving into Asia, possibly into Europe. From Homo erectus, a species you know, of Hydrobagensis evolved in Africa, or Rhodesiensis, um, moving into Europe, uh, possibly into, into Asia. The European population of Hydrobagensis evolved into the, into the Neanderthals, and the African population of Hydrobagensis evolved into Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens then leave Africa around 200,000 years ago, uh, thought that there was about 10,000 years overlap with Neanderthals in Europe, uh, not much evidence of overlap in Asia at that, in terms of that understanding. It seemed kind of pretty clear cut and a narrative that, that made sense. Obviously now, this is a much more complicated story. So the role of Heidelbergensis as a species has changed. We don't know if this is a last common ancestor between uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. It would seem that they aren't the last common ancestor now because they, they seem to be too young in the sequence. If, if the paleogenetic sort of indication of about 700,000 for a last common ancestor is true, that kind of throws that maybe Homo antecessor is the last common ancestor. Who knows? Uh, we, we, that, that, re, that degree of resolution is not clear. There are sort of early evolving Neanderthals in Spain around 400,000 years ago and a later population. Uh, there's some you know, genetic exchange. There's the, the Denisovans that have appeared on the scene. Uh, the resolution in Asia is increasingly complex and more fine-tuned around you know, kind of Asian erectus populations and a Sunda erectus population, maybe an archaic uh, in China. And, you know, Floresiensis is there and Luzonensis and 
potentially early forms of Pharisiensis around 700,000. The African picture is more complicated in terms of uh, seems to be some genetic exchange around 2% within African populations with an archaic population that we, we don't know what species that is. Curious Naledi hanging on until, you know, kind of 200,000 or so. So, you know, our picture of, of um, human evolution has dramatically changed. And this is my kind of attempt to try and interpret some of this. Uh, you know, it seems, you know, from genetics that, you know, divergence in Homo sapiens is very early on, maybe, you know, around 300,000, almost at the emergence of our species. There's ideas now that Homo sapiens evolved in, in Africa, not in one location, but across the, but across the continent. Uh, Ellie Scarry's work has really kind of thrown some interesting questions up around this. Um, there's a lot of genetic uh, introgressions uh, and breeding events between Neanderthals, Denisovans and Homo sapiens. Now our picture of human evolution is, is much more interesting and, and much more complex and I, I embrace that complexity because I you know we're a complex species it, it makes sense that our evolutionary history would be equally uh, complex. But what does that you know how do we then interpret perhaps the implications for a similar with these giant hand axes at a young age and i think there's only kind of three three interpretations that would kind of make sense if if this dating holds true and that is a that is a really big if but i think it's, a, it's an interesting thought experiment so either it might be a group of homo sapiens you know 100,000 to 60,000 who start to engage in a more archaic technology but with strong individual expression. So Herto we see you know an evolving modern human form but using actually an uh, artifacts. Are we seeing something like that being continued down into uh, that kind of 100,000 or less year range? Or perhaps more interestingly or intriguingly could this be uh, you know, a remnant archaic population maybe a hide up against us or rhodesiensis you know and i'm thinking here that there's this that there's that two percent integration into african populations around a hundred thousand years ago is this a hide up against us rhodesiensis sort of a population that's hanging on ramping up the use of its material culture to produce these very large uh giant hand axes as a as a social signal perhaps in response to a an encroaching uh, Homo sapiens population. The Middle Stone Age um, record for Isimila is there, but it's certainly not in big numbers, and it tends to sort of be around the edges of where the of what we might consider the Ashelian uh, assemblages to be um, to be to be located, and and that kind of is a is an observation both from walking around, spending a lot of time walking around Isimila in the field, and looking at the museum collections. But of course, you know, if the genetics, paleogenetics has shown us anything is that we don't really know a huge amount about human evolution, despite, you know, sort of um, studies into it over the last 200 years or so. Could it be another as yet unknown, undiscovered hominin like a Denisovan kind of kicking around in the African landscape doing something really unusual? Um, and I think I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and thank you very much for, for, for listening.